2017, I embarked upon a quest to thoroughly debunk the documentary Vaxxed, and while it did take two years to do so, I feel it was successful. Now since that time, Andrew Wakefield and the Vax team have been working on their second installment, Vaxxed 2, The People's Truth. Now this new movie is a shadow of the first one. It is rambling, it is poor production quality, and frankly, it's boring. But the real danger of Vaxxed 2 is why it was made. My relationship with Vaxxed and the team is deeper than just making a few debunking videos. I've met several people involved when I snuck into Caljam for my mini documentary. In Vax 2, I saw it in theater when it came to my town of Eugene, Oregon. Granted, I didn't pay for it. I bought a ticket to Jojo Rabbit and then I snuck in. And many in attendance were wearing Vax shirts and the theater itself was completely packed, leaving me to sit on the stairs. As this plotting mess of a film played out, I saw these attendees entranced moaning in sadness or gasping when the film cued them to. And despite my efforts to kind of hide my identity with sunglasses, a ball cap, and a blazer, I'm pretty sure the organizer for the screening knew exactly who I was, as every time she saw me, she gave me very, very nasty scowls. I seem to be kind of a public adversary at this point to the producers of the film and their many, many fans. I am very comfortable with this. Anyway, on to the movie. One of the first topics the film opens with is the Tribeca Film Festival. Early in 2016, it had been promoted that Vaxxed would be shown at the festival. Robert De Niro, the co-founder, had defended the film because it was deeply personal for him and his family, given he had an autistic son. After a massive public outcry, the film was pulled from the festival, and Robert De Niro went on record as saying, After reviewing it over the past few days with the Tribeca Film Festival team and others from the scientific community, we do not believe it contributes to or furthers the discussion I had hoped for. That notion would later fall apart the next year when he'd hold a conference with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. offering anyone a $100,000 reward if they can prove vaccines are safe. Yeah, Robert De Niro, that's proven pretty much every single day. Anyway, the film getting pulled was probably the best thing that could have ever happened to it. With this controversy, probably more people will see this movie. Yeah, uh, as they should, as they should. Uh, it was an extraordinary moment, and it really brings home how censorship works or doesn't work for the other side. They'd never confronted anything like this before. They'd never had to deal with a film like this, and they censored it. And the censorship caused it to explode. This provided millions in free advertising. Who isn't enticed to see a documentary so controversial it was banned from an event? And it worked incredibly well. Vax didn't perform nearly as well as a regular mainstream movie, but the underground feel to the film only enhanced the appeal. You see, this is what they don't want you to see. Everybody is now wondering about this movie that nobody wants you to see. But now the Vax 2 is out, they can very gleefully boast about how well that worked out for them. But the real question is, why did Vax 2 get made? Is there more information? Maybe they just wanted to cash in on the success of the first one? Well, let's examine it. To answer that, we'll have to look at what the Vax team did immediately after the release of the movie. They bought a bus. We were on planes every other day going to a new theater or a new city. And I remember Polly was sitting there and she said, we need a bus. Well, it's an RV, but whatever. The Vax team started using the bus as a mobile promotional billboard for their shows around the country, and then began recording testimonials of the people who would come to see the film, and if they believed their family had a vaccine injury, they would sign the RV. Those testimonials represent the bulk of the second film. Now it is not and never has been my intention to try and make light of anyone being harmed or injured, especially children, but at the same time, if these stories, these concepts, these testimonials could lead somebody to not vaccinate and then put their child at risk, I think that it is absolutely reasonable and important to put these under some scrutiny to see if they stand up. So we're going to do that with a few of the testimonials right now. Hannah Robinson was a bit of a minor celebrity in the anti-vax circles. According to her and her family, the Gardasil vaccine racked her body with seizures, pain, rendered her sterile, and removed her ability to walk. She was admitted to the hospital many, many times and sent to many specialists. 
Now, nobody could find anything wrong with her through repeated testing over and over and over, and some people thought that maybe she had a conversion disorder, but her family adamantly refused to send her to a psychologist. Ultimately, she lost her damage claim. However, there is good news. She has since miraculously healed from most of her injuries and has a baby now. So, that's good. Another emotionally charged story was about Michael LaHood, a young autistic boy. And his father, Nico, speaks very passionately about how much he loves his son and how angry he is at who he believes is behind his condition, that being vaccines. However, Nico LaHood was a district attorney in Bexar County, Texas, who went on an unhinged rant about George Soros when he lost his election, and he quite famously was known for claiming that there was a Muslim Sharia court being set up in Dallas. Now the last one that I'm going to mention right now is Colton Barrett, and the story of Colton is very sad, and it's been used, weaponized, abused, dragged through the mud for years by the anti-vaccine movement, and you'll understand why soon. Colton was a young boy who was suddenly struck with a debilitating disease that first made him a quadriplegic, and then able to relearn to walk but forever tied to a breathing machine. Colton had acute transverse myelitis, and a rather nasty case of it. This condition affects the spine, and while no one knows exactly what the cause is, we have observed a number of factors that can cause it, ranging from viral and bacterial infections to parasites and pre-existing vascular disorders. In short, we don't really know why it happens, but we do know enough that we can kind of see very similar things, and this can also sometimes be the very beginning of another disease like multiple sclerosis. Colton developed this terrible condition two weeks after his last shot of Gardasil. Now this sounds damning if not for two major factors. The first one being that he had already received the first two shots within six months with absolutely no prior effect. And additionally, acute transverse myelitis tends to have an onset within days or even hours from the triggering effect. That it took two weeks, let alone six months, for this to cause his condition is unlikely. Now, can I or anyone else say that for certain? No, absolutely not. But we can say pretty confidently that if this was something that was going to happen as a side effect of Gardasil, we would have seen thousands of cases just like this. And so far, Colton Barrett's was the only one. Colton's story is immensely tragic because his condition was brought to light twice. The first was when the Vax team interviewed him. The second is after Colton had taken his life. Since then, this story has been used as a prop and even a fundraising tool for anti-vaccine activists. So from here, the film touches base with a not-doctor who makes wild, wild claims about how the unvaccinated are the new Jews in a medical holocaust, and then we get to Suzanne Humphreys. Suzanne is an especially dangerous kind of propagandist. Listen to her motivation to become a questioner of vaccines. What made me realize there might be a problem with vaccines was one of my own patients telling me that they were fine until they had that vaccine. Now, keep in mind her own stated qualifications, she said just before that. My name is Dr. Suzanne Humphreys. I am primarily educated with a BA in physics, and then I went on to medical school and studied internal medicine and specialized in nephrology. Now, what caused a legit doctor to cast aside all of her convictions, embrace homeopathy of all things, and become an anti-vaccine crank? I have no idea. Maybe she just wasn't a good doctor. Regardless, her breakout book, Dissolving Illusions, is a clear example of how her grift works. Reinterpret the data in a way that makes no sense, but any passive reader won't catch. Then shift those conclusions within the margins just enough to get the answer you want. Regardless, here's Polly Tommy explaining why Suzanne Humphreys was so important. So we were honored to have Dr. Suzanne Humphreys come on the bus. All we ever hear is, Polly, you can't be doing what you're doing because you don't have a medical degree. And here is Dr. Suzanne with a medical degree, a great doctor, coming on the bus. Everything fits in place. The movie then uses this as a segue into a section called Doctors. They do a good job cycling through footage after footage of doctors and other professionals so quickly, none of them say anything of real substance. But we've got some great entries in here. We've got Lisa Rankin, a former doctor turned author who believes we can heal with the power of belief. 
We've got Judy Mikovits. I remember her. We've seen her uh, babbling incoherently in the Plandemic documentary. Uh, Patricia Ryan is a practicing doctor, but also a hardcore anti-vaxxer. Um, ooh, Paul Thomas. Uh, he's a doctor with a YouTube channel uh, with well over a million and a half subscribers. It's true. Uh, seriously, this channel is very weird. I don't really know what's going on here, but it's like really... Those thumbnails are really creepy, man. Super creepy. Anyway, he claims that we need the unethical vaxxed versus unvaxxed study. You know, the, the one that they always call for that would knowingly and willingly put children at direct risk of infection. You know. Basically, he's an anti-vaxxer that does his best to hide the fact that he's an anti-vaxxer. Cornelia Franz is a pediatrician who recommends homeopathy, aka magic water to her patients. And lastly, we come to Tatiana Okyanovich. I think that's right. My name is Tatiana Obuchanich. My qualifications, first of all, I'm a mom, and I believe that's my uh, most important qualification. Uh, no, no, it isn't, especially when you're talking about something so important like immunology. Um, she's been embraced by the anti-vaccine movement uh, because... And, and I just happen to have a PhD in immunology in addition to that. Now, the fun part is she's not actually an immunologist because you have to have a medical degree for that. As well, I went and I dug around and she doesn't seem to be the lead researcher on any studies, any papers. Her own thesis actually has data sets that prove that vaccines work and are very effective. And uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She uh, she's a homeopath as well. Just uh, why not? I bet you can catch wind that this is all a hilarious mess, but full disclosure, I didn't look at every name they brought up, and it's possible some are just regular doctors who happen to be intellectually compromised on vaccines. It's possible. Regardless, these people are, by appearing in this movie, absolutely assisting in what I would say with all confidence, a great harm. The movie then shifts hard right into talking about Gardasil. Man, oh man, do anti-vaxxers hate Gardasil. It's a little difficult to emphasize just how much they have hitched their wagons to this idea that the vaccine against HPV infections is the worst thing on the planet. Now, in my humble opinion, as somebody who's been tracking the behavior of these people for quite a while, I tend to think that they drift towards Gardasil when they've gotten beaten down enough that MMR vaccines are totally safe. So they then shift back into this one to further justify their fear based belief system, but that's just my opinion. Gardasil protects against certain strains of human papilloma virus, or HPV, specifically those that are affecting the genitals and promote cervical cancer, and it overwhelmingly works. As recent as June of 2019, there was a huge meta-analysis that shows exactly how efficient it can be at not only protecting people who take it, but improving the statistical herd immunity, dropping infection rates drastically. Keep in mind, in the United States of America, it's theorized that up to 80% of sexually active people have HPV. And this is not simply something that affects horny teens, it affects everyone, and Gardasil and Cervarix and any other future HPV vaccines are our best way to combat it. For about 20 minutes, we're subjected to almost nothing but testimonials one after another, describing some terrible situation, but really nothing to back up that Gardasil is what caused it. Uh, this is also the section where they discuss Colton Barrett, which I mentioned before. Often it's simply a young teenager and her mother and their descriptions of how well she used to do in school, but now her grades are falling and she's lazy. Yeah, she's a teenager. There's some things of note we should point out. At the very beginning, we see this quote from Bernard Del Bargu. I predict that Gardasil will become the greatest medical scandal of all times, because at some point in time, the evidence will add up to prove that this vaccine has absolutely no effect on cervical cancer, and that the very many adverse effects which destroy lives and even kill serve no other purpose than to generate profit for the manufacturers. Former Merck physician. The problem is that Bernard never worked for Merck. He was the head of a drug distribution facility. That would be like saying the post office works for Amazon. It, it makes no sense. He wouldn't have been privy to any information whatsoever. At one point, this girl claims the vaccine gave her fibrosing mediastinitis, something that is most commonly caused by a fungal infection, and there is no other case of it manifesting due to any vaccine. This girl claims the Gardasil shot gave her HPV, 
But Gardasil is an inactivated vaccine. In my mind, I knew that they were what gave me HPV. That means that the virus is dead. So I hate to tell you this, but I think you got the HPV from somewhere else. Robert F. Kennedy pops in at one point and says this. The death rates in the uh, Gardasil trials were 37 times the death rates for cervical cancer. Children who take that vaccine, the Gardasil vaccine, are 37 times more likely to die from the vaccine than they are to die from cervical cancer. Which is a complete fabrication. The main source of this comes from his own website, which reads, Annual deaths from cervical cancer in the U.S. are 2.3 out of 100,000. In the Gardasil clinical trials, there were 40 deaths in the groups exposed to either the vaccine, an aluminum-containing placebo, or a solution-containing polysorbate 80 and borax. Although about half of the deaths were accident or suicide-related, among the remaining fatalities, many of the causes of death, such as sepsis, cardiac events, and autoimmune conditions, could plausibly be vaccine-related. Except that that isn't true. By their own admission, half of them don't even count because they were either death by accident or suicide. And then the rest of them have never been shown through any scientific process to be caused by a Gardasil vaccination. The only way that this statistic makes any sense whatsoever is to fabricate it, to make it up, to lie. Then he says this. So the problem with Gardasil, like most vaccines, is it was never tested against a true placebo, an inert placebo. And CDC and HHS say, if you don't test it against a true placebo, it's not science. Yeah, that's not true. I mean, doing double-blind studies is one of the best ways to do science, sure. But we can overcome not doing a double-blind study through... Uh, repeated testing and uh, overwhelming evidence. The placebo is just an inert substance that doesn't cause any damage, that they give one group of individuals in a particular clinical study, and then they give the drug, that's the experimental group, they give that to a, another set of individuals. Right, okay, so we vaccinate a group of kids, and then we intentionally don't vaccinate a group of kids. And then we subject those kids to potentially being infected by a lethal virus. How do you maniacs not get this by now? Why that is such a bad idea? You have no way of gauging whether the injuries you're seeing from the product are being caused by that product or whether they're just bad, sad coincidences. Actually, you do. Through science. Testing. Meta-analysis. And most of these are, yes, sad, bad coincidences. Uh, thanks for clearing that up. The big heavy hitter in this section, however, is the story of Christina Tarsell. This young woman passed away at the age of 21, and through some twists and turns, her family was awarded a settlement from the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. The details of the case have been summarized for the sake of brevity, but all citations are in the description. To make it simple, here is the timeline. She received her first shot of Gardasil on September 12th, 2007. Two months later, on November 20th, she received the second dose. She was then seen by an internist who detected that she had an irregular heartbeat. An ECG showed she had a heart concern, and then a second one a month later confirmed that yes, there was a problem. Now, this is not considered as a result of the vaccine at the time, most likely because such heart problems have a multitude of potential causes, uh, not the least of we, which can just be hereditary or genetic. Now, eight months later, on June 3rd, 2008, she got the third shot of Gardasil. Two days later, she had a rash, but nowhere near the injection site. It was up by her neck. She felt dizzy for five days, but continued on pretty much as normal. Uh, she then seemed to be totally fine for about a week, and then Nobody saw her for about four days until her body was discovered. Um, it is dated that she passed away June 21st, 2008. Immediately, her family blamed the vaccine, and the pathologist who performed her autopsy filed a VAERS report, and her family put in a claim with the NVICP. The details are worth a read, but the first ruling on February 16th, 2016 was, number one. Christina's mom had not demonstrated that the arrhythmia, an irregular heartbeat, 
that Christina had occurred only after the administration of the vaccine. Number two, she had not proved a more likely than not medical theory. And number three, even if she had provided a plausible medical theory, she had not shown that in this case, the death was a result of what the theory suggested. Now, this was then appealed by a federal claims judge. Uh, this judge then cast doubts that the original conclusion uh, had not correctly interpreted the witness statements uh, of the doctors that Christina's mom had testified. So the case is now sent back to the original special master in charge. So we have the first ruling that says no. The second ruling of the, the claims judge says, I think we need to reconsider. It goes back to the special master for arbitration. Here's where it gets weird. The special master then went further into explaining in the legal proceedings how full of holes the case was, how Christina's medical history was explicitly interpreted by doctors to avoid any other conclusions but the vaccine being the cause. In many ways, the third ruling showed even more evidence that Gardasil didn't kill Christina. However, through the mess of this red tape, the family was awarded because, and this is true, ruling otherwise would be seen as having a bias against the family. I want to be clear, nobody actually knows what took the life of this young lady so early, but for over a decade her case was in limbo and then settled through a bureaucratic dead end. However, the case was never left to rest, and Christina and her case were constantly being propped up, and still to this day are propped up, by anti-vaxxers using her death as propaganda. In fact, in this movie, they prominently display her two-day-old corpse for the audience. And if you didn't think that was exploitative enough... We're doing this broadcast in memory of these babies. Babies who have passed away. And so as we traveled on and on and on, we then met parents who, who would tell us that they would vaccinate their babies and then their babies would die. And this is where the movie gets absolutely shameless. The infant mortality rate study that was conducted by the Centers for Disease Control in 2014, and they looked at the incidence of infant mortality in um, 34 developed nations, and the United States placed last. We were 34th out of all of these developed nations. Okay, well, let's take a look at that study. In 2010, the U.S. infant mortality rate was 6.1 infant deaths per 1,000 live births, and the United States ranked 26th in infant mortality among Organization for Economic Cooperation and Developed Countries. Okay, ouch. <laughs> Sounds bad, right? Well, keep reading. After excluding births at less than 24 weeks of gestation to ensure international compatibility, the U.S. infant mortality rate was 4.2, still higher than for most European countries and about twice the rates for Finland, Sweden, and Denmark. Now, what this means is when you remove the very preterm births, the numbers start to look a bit more favorable. Now, the reason this is, uh, is because it's bringing it closer in line with how other countries report what constitutes a birth. In the United States, if we have, say, a miscarriage, it is actually listed in those numbers as a birth, whereas in most other countries that are reporting, they don't. So obviously, our mortality rate is way higher. Still though, we're twice that of Sweden? Ouch. About 39% of the United States' higher infant mortality rate when compared with that of Sweden was due to a higher percentage of preterm births while 47% was due to a higher infant mortality rate at 37 weeks of gestation or more. If the United States could reduce these two factors to Sweden's levels, the U.S. infant mortality rate would fall by 43%, with nearly 7,300 infant deaths averted annually. Now, what this means is that the gap is due to Americans having a huge number of preterm births. And if we could combat that, we'd be in line with the top infant mortality rates in the world. However, that isn't what the movie is trying to tell you. The infant mortality rate study that was conducted by the Centers for Disease Control in 2014, and they looked at the incidence of infant mortality 
in um, 34 developed nations, we give the most vaccines during the first year of life. Notice how none of that has anything to do with vaccines. Here's a meta study on the relationship between vaccines and sudden infant death syndrome. Conclusions, immunizations are associated with halving of the risk of SIDS. There are biological reasons why this association may be causal, but other factors such as the healthy vaccine effect may be important. Immunization should be part of the SIDS prevention campaigns. Well, now I'm going to show you a section from the movie. And I want you to understand that this is a very powerful moment of grief for a woman who lost her baby. Me showing this to you is done with the utmost of respect for her pain and what she had to go through. But at that appointment, that morning, as I was laying him on the table to get him vaccinated, Okay. And the nurse is going to stick the needle in his right thigh. Just something screamed in me. No, don't wait. But at that point, the moment had passed. And then as I left for my shift, I went and gave him a kiss. And I just remember the look on his face, he was just so sad. The last time I kissed his alive, warm cheek. That is terrible. And similar stories are shared in this section of the film. And like I said with the story of Christina, nobody can know just from watching the film what happened to take their lives. But it's important that we understand where this woman and other people like her are coming from. She is stricken with overwhelming guilt. And that guilt causes her to blame herself, but it also primes her emotionally to want to find an external factor that can also be culpable in losing her child. It's the same guilt a parent might feel when their child is autistic and they have no real villain to blame it on. This grief and pain makes these people vulnerable to the anti-vax movement. And you can see it at work here in the film, as long as you manage to break the hypnotism of tragedies they try to overwhelm you with. Now the last section of the movie is called The Unvaccinated. So we took a break after the first leg and we all had time to reflect on what had just happened with this amazing amount of people turning up to tell their stories. And that's when we suddenly realised the unvaccinated people are there for a reason. We need to start the second leg interviewing them as well. They're not doing vaccinated versus unvaccinated studies because they're frightened of the results. And in the vacuum of that study, which would be unethical and monstrous, the film instead bombards you with the most goofy characters babbling about their kids' health in the most bizarre way. Mommy and Daddy have had a vaccine, but none of you children, not one. I mean, they have amazing immune systems. When they get sick, we get over it in one day. Both of my kids are really, really healthy. Health-wise, she's insanely healthy. I mean, she never gets sick. They're, they're both insanely intelligent. They're, mm -hmm. they're, um, Their health is ridiculous. And, and they, get, they, they, ridiculous. You know, they, they, it's, they, they recover fast well, from things. My kids are super healthy. They are very healthy kids. Uh, and then here comes Humphreys with her weirdest statement ever. I had never seen health like that. I didn't know that health like that was even possible. What the hell does that even mean? This is the best therapy ever. <laughs> Grab an unvaccinated baby and cuddle it. <laughs> Sorry. It's perfect. What? But near the end of this section and the film is this incredibly important moment. When you get out into the population and you start to meet people who, because they've heard of our stories, have not vaccinated their children, and you see these wonderful, healthy, happy, robust children, then it just makes all the difference in the world. Okay, that's a little odd to hear, but then Andrew Wakefield adds, And these are the children that actually now we need to protect above all others. Not force them to be vaccinated by rule of law, but to protect them because they're going to be looking after the damaged children in the future. Now, I don't think that Andrew Wakefield is intentionally trying to make the future sound like some eugenics dystopia. 
but that is absolutely how it came across to me. Despite the fact that more children are already vaccinated as opposed to unvaccinated, and it's been that way for decades, we've yet to see this hellish reality come to pass. It feels like he and the Vax team are promoting unvaccination as some sort of like way to attain the Ubermensch. I mean, is that it? Is that why Vax 2 was made? To, to try and convince people that being unvaccinated is a sense of superiority? I don't think so. I think that's just a little added flavoring to what the real point is. We started this journey with that central question. Why make Vax 2? Was there new information? No, not really. In fact, there was barely any information at all. Most of the content of the film is testimonials filmed in an RV with an iPhone uh, that were already published previously to their YouTube channel. Was it to make money? I doubt it. I'm sure the small showings they managed to have generated some income, sure. But significant? No, not really. This is the point of Vaxxed 2. It can change. And it will change, and we will win this battle, if that's what it is. And we will win it through the parents' stories. We will win it through the parents telling their truth. We'll win it through the doctors and nurses standing up and saying, this is what I know to be true. That's it. That's the point right there. Vax 2 is a confirmation for the anti-vaccine movement. It's a gesture of solidarity between people all over the world all reinforcing each other's beliefs. It's the most simplistic and effective way to excite old members and new. The stories, the familiarity, and just as impactful as it could be, it's also hollow and vapid. It's a group hypnotism. It primes parents to interpret the world through an anti-vaccine lens. It strips them of critical consideration and open-mindedness, and instills within them fear. And for those fervent anti-vaxxers, it gives them confirmation and a sense of smug superiority. Vax 2 is a boring, poorly produced, badly edited, chunk of cult propaganda. I just had a few thoughts that I wanted to throw in here at the end of the video. Uh, Vax 2 is not dense on claims. I pretty much relies on Vax 1 to do so, which is why I didn't have to spend two years trying to debunk this one. Um, but I still felt that because it stands as a piece of consumable culture, uh, it was my responsibility to try and put forth as much counter as I can uh, and in as concise of a way as possible. Uh, extensive, extensive citations are in the description of this video. Um, it's, it's rough to try and counteract this kind of propaganda because Vax 2 itself is such a incredible example of how they reinforce each other and how they utilize the opposite of science and that is testimonials word of mouth uh you know the 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 feelings of people who might share a similar pain to you um and that's how they, they kind of hypnotize people into it. And it's, uh, it's nefarious and it's dangerous. But if you, if you know how to examine it through that lens, it's pretty fascinating to try and understand how these people operate. So, um, yeah, I, I will continue to do so anytime something like this comes up. It's my job. Happy to do it. Um, and I will see you guys in the next episode. Take care. I figured also I'm going to try and get better at this whole like YouTuber thing and trying to market myself. So if you do feel compelled to want to help and support this channel, there is a whole section in the description uh, called support and you know, anything helps. I really appreciate it from my family to yours. Take care and bye bye. <laughs>